Hello everybody, welcome to the History Valley Podcast with your host, Jacob Berman. Today I am joined by Professor Bart Ehrman. Professor Bart Ehrman is uh, the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He began his teaching career at Rutgers University and joined the faculty in the Department of Religious Studies at UNC in 1988, where he has served as both the Director of Graduate Studies and the Chair of the Department. Professor Ehrman completed his Master's of Divinity and PhD degrees at Princeton Seminary, where his 1985 doctoral dissertation was awarded magna cum laude, an expert on the New Testament and the history of early Christianity, has written or edited 30 books, numerous scholarly articles, and dozens of, of book reviews, in addition to works of scholarship. Professor Ehrman has written several textbooks for undergraduate students and trade books for general audiences. Five of his books have been on the New York Times bestseller list, including Misquoting Jesus, God's Problem, Jesus Interrupted, Forged, and How Jesus Became God. His books have been translated into 27 languages. Professor Ehrman has served as president of the Southeast Region of the Society of Biblical Literature and chair of the New Testament Textual Criticism section of the Society. Among his editorial positions, he has served as associate editor for the Journal of Early Christian Studies, book review editor of the Journal of Biblical Literature, and editor of the monograph series New Testament in the Greek Fathers Scholars Press. He currently serves as co-editor of the series New Testament Tools, Studies, and Documents, E.J. Brill, co-editor-in-chief for the International Journal of Early Christian Studies. Vigeli Christiani, and area editor, Early Christianity for the Encyclopedia of Ancient History. All right, so that takes me to my first question for you, Professor Ehrman. What would you say is the best evidence that you can think of for the historical Jesus? Uh, well, uh, great, great question. Thanks, Jacob, for having me, having me on. Uh, by that question, you mean what's the best evidence that there was a historical Jesus? Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, it's kind of hard to pick the best evidence because there's lots of evidence. <laughs> it's like, it's, uh, you know, what's the best evidence that Abraham Lincoln lived? <laughs> well, uh, I guess you have photographs of him. Um, right. Well, we have um, we have numerous uh, sort. We, G- look, Jesus is the best documented figure from the uh, first century uh, in Judea um, by in terms of external evidence um he's he uh there's nobody else that you have four biographies written of (laughs) (laughs) for example and these biographies these these uh these books i mean the gospels of course they're religious literature they are absolute religious literature but they're written in the form uh, of ancient biographies so you can compare them with (laughs) accounts written by other biographers and historians of the day and they follow basically the same kinds of principles and they're based on earlier sources and so these gospels, they're, they're 30, 40, 50 years removed from the events, but they're based on earlier sources. And there, uh, there are a lot of independent early sources behind these gospels. They're, so that it's not that they all go back to one thing. They, there are lots of sources uh, that are behind the, the multiple sources we already have, including one source, the Apostle Paul, who uh, knows about the historical Jesus, quotes some of the things he said, um, mentions a couple of things that he did, and knows his brother. <laughs> and so, I mean, Paul, Paul actually, and so, um, and, know, and knows his closest disciple, uh, Peter. So, a person knows them. So, you know, I, uh, what's the best evidence? I mean, I guess the best evidence is that if, um, if, um, if Jesus didn't exist, you'd think his brother would know about it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I bring that. I ask that question because, as you've known, and you, you've talked about this extensively, including in your book, "Did Jesus Exist?" Um, the mythicist claims that that the Gospels can't be used as evidence because they postdate Paul, and Paul seems to be ignorant of the Gospel story. But I've also heard you say in the past many times that Paul is writing letters, and so one can't expect him to get into all the details, and he's arguing theology. Um, and, and, and the mythicists often like to say that, okay, well, the Gospels are long after Paul, and, and they bring up so many things that Paul doesn't bring up. But, um, but yeah, what, what has bothered me personally is that, okay, is this as you just brought up a moment ago? James is the brother of Jesus. So how could he have a brother if he didn't exist? And, and everything that comes to mind is the testimonium. And I've, I know you've talked about the testimony many times. Um, 
the dimension that Josephus has about the crucifixion of Jesus. And that actually takes me to my second question for you. What kind of evidence shows that the mythicists are just absolutely wrong with the testimony was a total forgery at the hands of Eusebius? Why is that wrong? Um, okay, so I mean, first let me say about Paul and the Gospels. I mean, Paul mm -hmm. is not ignorant about the historical Jesus. I, I mean, I don't know how anybody could say that. He quotes him several times, and he, he refers to his, he, he talks about his crucifixion all the time. I mean, Paul, Paul's, I mean, Paul is not ignorant. <laughs> so, and, and yes, he's earlier than the Gospels, and you, you can't expect Paul to write the life of Jesus. I mean, it's like saying, you know, that a mythicist, uh, you know, the mythicist can't be trusted uh, if they say something about uh, Trump's presidency because they, you know, they didn't write about that. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, but they talked about it. <laughs> so, all right, okay. So, on to, yeah, on to the testimony. So, you're referring to the testimony in Flaviano. Right. Uh, which is the, the technical term that scholars use when they when they when they want to use a Latin phrase when a perfectly good English one works. <laughs> the, the English one would be the uh, testimony of Josephus. <laughs> so Josephus took on the uh, the name of the uh, the emperor as a kind of a secondary name, Flavianum, mm -hmm. the Fabian di dynasty. Um, Josephus wrote a number of number of works that we still have. Um, he wrote an autobiography, short autobiography, and he wrote, he wrote a multi-volume uh, uh, account of the wars of uh, uh, the Jewish uprising against Rome that he was involved with on the Jewish side before he was captured by the Romans. And so he's a first hand. So he has six volumes on that. He has 20, he has 20 volumes on the history of the Jews. Um, that is um, usually called the antiquities, the antiquities of the Jews. And that it's quite an amazing book. It, it, it starts with Adam. <laughs> like Adam and Eve. It traces the history of the Jewish people from Adam and Eve up to his own day. So it's, a, it's pretty massive. Um, he spends more time dealing with the events in his own time, his own time period. Basically, he's writing at the end of the first century. And so um, Jesus would have died around the year 30. Josephus is writing about 60 years after that, probably about the same time, say, as the Gospel of John is being written. Uh, and Josephus does talk about a lot of uh, Jews who lived in the first century. Um, and um, he, he spends more time on the ones that he think were most important, of course. So there are two references to Jesus in uh, Josephus' Antiquities. Um, one uh, occurs in chapter 20. It's a short one where, where Jose Josephus is mentioning the death of a man named James, and he says, he tries to tell you which James it is, because James is a common name. And so mm -hmm. since people don't have last names, <laughs> you've got to identify them somehow or other. And so you, you come up with some identifying marker. And the identifying marker for James is that he was the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ. And so uh, that's an off-the-cuff comment. But it's usually read as a statement that you know who that is, who, the Jesus who's called mm -hmm. the Christ. And the reason you know who that is is because in chapter in book 18, two books earlier, he gives a description of, of who Jesus was. Um, and he says he says interesting things that uh, coincide. Uh, the, the basic factual information he gives coincides with what we get in the New Testament. He says that Jesus was a um, was was a was a man who had a had a following uh, that he, he taught uh, about. He says both Jews and Greeks. I don't think that's probably right historically. I don't think Jesus had Greek followers, but but mm -hmm. he, he thought he did. Um, that he taught that he had he, he taught he was a teacher. Uh, that he was known to have done uh, amazing deeds, uh, but that he was uh, turned over to the authorities by the Rome by the Jewish leaders, uh, and that he ended up uh, being being executed. Uh, but that his followers continued on down to Josephus's own day. Um, and so that's, that's, yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the Gospels as well. Um, some people have argued over the years, not just mythicists, I mean, people have wondered over the years, is this, does this really go back to Josephus? And the, the big issue is that in this passage in Josephus, there are several statements that are not the kind of thing that a non-Christian Jew would say about Jesus. <laughs> 
<laughs> because he says uh, he was a man, if you if you could call him a man, <laughs> or he was the Messiah. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa, what? <laughs> and then at one point he says that, you know, in order to fulfill the scriptures, he was raised from the dead on the third day. But, yeah, uh, you know, that really does. We know from his autobiography, we know from his autobiography that he um, he did not become a Christian. And so these statements look like they look a little bit strange. So the deal is that uh, I mentioned that Josephus was involved in the Jewish war before he got captured. Uh, within uh, the tradition of Israel, Josephus has always been considered a turncoat, uh, a betrayer of the cause, because he was, he was a leader, he was a general of the uh, Jewish troops up in Galilee. And when they were surrounded by the Roman troops, his, his men took a uh, suicide pact that they would draw draw lots and one would kill the other, who would kill the next, would kill, I mean, it'd go on like that until the two people would be left. And it turns out he was one of the, he drew the lot to be one of the two left. And when everybody else killed themselves, he turned himself in. Uh, mm -hmm. And so like all of his, and so this did not go down well. And he, he himself talks about this incident. He talks about it himself. But so uh, his writings, as important as they were, were not preserved by Jews through the Middle Ages. They, they wanted nothing to do with it. The, the writings were preserved by Christians. And so what it looks like is that Josephus had the statement about Jesus and the things he did, and he, and some scribe whomped it up a little bit, like scribes do. <laughs> Christian scribes are doing this with their own Bibles, but they certainly did it with Josephus. Uh, uh, there was a man, and then a scribe added, well, if you could call him a man, because he was the Messiah. <laughs> and so the scribe is adding in a few lines, uh, not, not whole lines, just like little statements. Uh, to, in order to show that Josephus do believe that Jesus was the Messiah who was raised from the dead. Uh, some people have taken that to an extreme to argue, well, the whole thing doesn't belong there. Um, and I think that that's wrong. I think that um, uh, you, not, you know, not for any personal religious re reasons. Uh, I'm not, I'm not personally a Christian, but I mean, but I think just on historical grounds, mm -hmm. I think the rest of the statement looks to me like something Josephus wrote. And it looks like chapter in book 20, he's referring back to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think that uh, I think it's authentic. Um, I don't think that he had this knowledge. You know, he wasn't born with this knowledge. Somebody gave him this information. But I think his knowledge was kind of floating around like lots of other knowledge that he records. Uh, and it's not that he'd read the Gospels. But, you know, obviously he's getting this from people who are saying these things. Mm hmm. And that brings me to the uh, to the next thing that I've been uh, curious about to hear your thoughts on because there are some um, there's, there's, a, there's another fringe theory floating around out there anachronistic um, historicity these people that think that there's some people out there that think that Jesus lived in another time um, other than like you know died at, he didn't die during the reign of Pilate he died in some other point maybe a hundred years earlier 50 60 years later 30 years later. What do you think about that? Um, I think that it doesn't make any sense at all. And um, be, because there's, I mean, you just wonder how much evidence is required. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you want, if you want to believe something, you can believe, you can believe anything you want and you can manufacture alternative theories. But you have to ask, what kind of evidence do you have for the theory? I, I personally believe that every theory ought to be entertained. We ought to look to see whether the moon landing happened. Um, but, you know, you know, we ought to look to see whether uh, 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 Elvis really died. You know, if somebody says he didn't die, then we should look and see if there's evidence on both sides and see what the evidence is. So what's the evidence that Jesus died 100 years earlier or 50 years later? For one thing, um, the 50 years later thing, how does that work exactly with the date with the writings of Paul? Mm -hmm. I mean, how what Paul's right got Paul has to be writing in the 50s. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons for knowing that Paul wrote in the 50s. So if Jesus died in the 80s, how does that work exactly? And um, so Anyway, so th there is massive evidence. <laughs> I don't know how much evidence a person needs, but I mean, 
I think somebody needs to sit down and say, well, what evidence do I need? And then see if they've got it. Because, I mean, this, if you talk about an ancient figure, as I said, Jesus is far better documented from external sources than Josephus or Pilate, Pontius Pilate. I mean, just in terms of the amount of information we have, I'm not saying this information is all historical. A lot of it's not historical at all. But the legends come from somewhere. You don't have legends of somebody who didn't exist if, if, if all you've got is, I mean, you have myths, you have let, but how do I put that? I didn't put that very well. I, I don't want to put it quite like that. You certainly have legends of people who didn't exist. You don't have, le- here's what I meant to say. You don't have legends of people who didn't exist if the legends exist, if the legends around before the person allegedly existed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> so uh, yeah, it still wasn't very clever, but that, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Earlier, you brought up that the Gospels used sources that are much earlier than the yeah. time that they were written. And yeah. in your in your books, you frequently talk about not just Q, but the M and L sources. Yeah. So do these sources, Q, M, and L, do they represent independent oral traditions that go back to the historical Jesus to his time? Uh, probably. Although they, they themselves were not oral traditions. And so for the readers who don't, or the listeners who don't know what this is all about, you, you have, you obviously have four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Three of them are very, very similar to each other. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell many of the same stories, usually in the same sequence. This happened and this and this. Even the, like the stories aren't related. Like, you know, Jesus healed this blind man. And then he, you know, healed this paralytic. Like, there's no connection between these stories, but they're told in the same sequence, usually. And sometimes they're told in the same words, like, like word for word the same. Okay, so somebody's copying somebody here. The only explanation is that somebody's copying somebody. And since the 19th century, uh, there have been overwhelming arguments that are almost certainly right, that Mark was uh, used by both Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke had some kind of copy of Mark and individually in front of them. But Matthew and Luke also have some, a lot of sayings of Jesus, um, sayings of Jesus that uh, are not found in Mark. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, the Lord's Prayer or the Beatitudes, you get you get versions of these in Matthew and you get versions in Luke, and they didn't get them from Mark because Mark doesn't have them. And there's pretty good reason for thinking that Luke didn't get them from Matthew and Matthew didn't get them from Luke. And if that's the case, then they must have gotten them from somewhere and so scholars in the 19th century came up with this hy- hypothetical document that's called Q. Uh, Q uh, stands for the German word Kuvella, Q-U-E-L-L-E. Uh, this was understood to be a source for Jesus say, some of Jesus' sayings. And so Kuvella means source in German. So it's the sayings Kuvella, or just call it Q. So um, I think that there's very good evidence for Q um, that it did exist at one time. Matthew also has a lot of stuff that's not found in Mark or Luke. So it's not from Q. It's not from um, not from Mark. And so um, scholars have just a long time called that his M material, M for Matthew, Matthew's special source. It might be like a single document, but I doubt it. I bet that it's probably a bunch of documents, probably or oral traditions he's heard. It's possible he just made some of the stuff up. I don't know. But there's there's like almost nothing to suggest that in the sense that the stories that you find in what's called M are shaped the same way that these other stories are. And these other stories look like they come from written source. So it looks like M's probably a written source and the same with mm-hmm. L. Um, and so, but again, with it, both M and L is Luke's special source. With both M and L, we don't know what we're talking about. Are we talking about like a single source? Are we talking about lots of written sources, lots of oral mm-hmm. sources? Luke starts his gospels by saying that many people have produced an account of Jesus' life but that he's now going to present an accurate one, which is an interesting statement to say uh, if Mark was one of his sources. <laughs> because if Mark is one of his sources, he seems to be implying that his predecessors didn't really do a very good job. So he might be kind of, uh, you know, kind of dishing Mark here a little bit. But if he had many sources and we only know of two of them, then it would seem likely that L would be multiple sources, written, written sources. Um, so anyway, so all of those have to predate Matthew, Mark, um, the Q and M and L have to predate Matthew and Luke, and so they're earlier. Q is earlier, so we don't know how early. 
a lot of scholars date Q to the 50s, but I, I don't know if it's the 50s. I mean, Matthew and Luke are writing the 80s, so I, I don't know when it's written, but before that. You also frequently talk about um, Jesus being an apocalyptic preacher. And what I'm curious about is, and this is what I wanted to ask you, is you also t uh, that, that, that you talk about that Jesus being a king, declaring himself king, was viewed as a threat by Pilate. And Pilate ordered the crucifixion of Jesus. Do you think this may or may not connect in any way to the growing messianic movement at the time of Jesus' ministry, the messianic rebels? Um, you mean outside of Jesus' followers, other other Messiah figures, you mean? Or do you mean within Jesus? Or, Jesus and or Jewish rebel factions, you know, rebels yeah, yeah, against yeah. rebellious yeah, yeah. Romans. Yeah, no, I think it completely fits into that context. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what's going on is, um, I, first of all, I think people have a kind of a mistaken understanding of Judaism at the time, just general people, because... You know, a lot of us get our information from movies. <laughs> Jesus movies have this kind of line that in, in a lot of these Jesus movies, the Jewish people in Israel at the time are seriously oppressed by the Romans more than anybody else in the world, and they're waiting for a Messiah. And so everybody's sitting around looking for a Messiah to come. And, you know, I think some people were, there definitely were people expecting a Messiah to come. There definitely were people expecting a Messiah to come. But... I don't think most Jews were sitting on the edge of their seat wondering if it's going to be next week. You know, they, uh, any more than most Jews today are sitting around wondering when the Messiah is going to come. I think most people in the ancient world were just trying to figure out how to feed their family tomorrow. You know, and so I don't think they were thinking about a Messiah coming. Very, I don't think everybody was. Some, some were. And there were, uh, there were different expectations about what that Messiah might be like uh, that are well attested for this period. Uh, for example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in uh, from, in other writings that are not in the Bible, uh, from the time of Jews having a variety of expectations of what the Messiah is going to be, the the standard explanation was that the Messiah was going to be a future military ruler, who would um, wipe out the enemy, and uh, and and establish a kingdom. Uh, so Israel would become a sovereign kingdom again, like it had been under King David. In the Old Testament. Uh, David himself is promised by God that he will always have a descendant sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Um, and so there'll be a Davidic dynasty. And as it turns out, I mean, it's fairly remarkable, but that dynasty did exist for about 400 years. For 400 years, there was a Davidic king sitting on the throne. They got wiped out by the Babylonians. Uh, and so this promise came to nothing after that. But some Jewish thinkers started to think, well, you know, God promised there's always going to be a ruler, a king. Uh, they call him the Messiah because the, the word Messiah is from the Hebrew word Mashiach, and it means anointed one because the Jewish king, when he went through his coronation ceremony, had, had perfumed oil poured on his head to show that God had favored him. And so he's called the anointed one. So the anointed one is the king. And many Jews, many Jews, not all Jews, some Jews expected that there'd be a future king like that. And that's what the Messiah was supposed to be. Other Jews thought that this, this savior from the enemies wouldn't be a human king. He might be like a divine figure, some kind of cosmic judge that God's going to send from heaven to wipe out his enemies. Uh, and other people thought that he was going to be a great priest who could interpret the law of God and, and keep people holy and kind of rule the people with holiness. And so there are various expectations. What I, what I argue in my, uh, in my various books is that Jesus probably understood himself to be a Messiah, and that he didn't, he didn't publicize this, uh, but that he thought that what was going to happen was that God was, was fed up with the powers of evil in the world, and God was going to intervene and bring in a new kingdom. Jesus talked constantly in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, about the kingdom of God that is almost here. For ancient Jews, the kingdom of God meant a kingdom, <laughs> a kingdom, like a place where there's a king <laughs> and there's a, there's a place. And uh, Jesus thought this was going to happen soon and that this cosmic judge was going to wipe out the powers that are controlling Israel now and Israel would be made a sovereign state. 
And I think Jesus thought that he would be made the king. I've got, comp not complicated, I've got lots of reasons for that. Some of them are kind of complicated, but it, it, it is very important to note what you pointed out, uh, Jacob, that, that Jesus was executed by the Romans for, on a particular charge. The charge against the charge of Pilate brought against Jesus was not that he was, you know, calling himself God, or that he was like a, a, you know, teaching people to love one another. Or you know, the charge was that he called himself the King of the Jews. Um, that's the charge reported at his trial in multiple sources. It's it's the placard above his head when he gets crucified in multiple sources. It makes sense because it's a political charge that would be that would bring a death sentence, and so. Uh, he wasn't accused of being a common criminal or anything. He was accused of calling himself the king, and I think he really did call himself the king. Um, and I think that that's why they crucified him, because he thought that the kingdom was going to come and he'd be made the future king. So he, he really thought he would be the Messiah in that apocalyptic sense, the sense that the, God's going to destroy the forces of evil and set up Jesus and his kingdom. Going back to the Q, M, and L sources, do most scholars believe that the Gospels used not just Q, but M and L? Matthew used M and L used, uh, and Luke used L. Um, yeah, I think, so the majority opinion, the, the big debate is not about M and L. Mm -hmm. the, and the big debate isn't like a big debate, but it's a debate um, whether Q existed or not. There are scholars who are renewing the idea that Matthew actually copied Mark and that Luke copied both of them. Um, and that's possible. It eliminates a hypothetical source. So on that level, uh, it's, a, it's a good theory. The problem is it doesn't make sense of a lot of the data. And so it's not the majority opinion at all. The majority of scholars still think there's a Q. Uh, once you've got Q and Mark, you can explain a good bit of uh, Matthew and Luke but there's all sorts of things, you know, like in Luke, for example, the parable of the Good Samaritan or the parable of the prodigal son or um, uh, the, the birth story in Luke or the birth story in Matthew or the like there, there, there's all this material that is found in one, but not any of the others. Uh, and it either came from somewhere or these guys are just making it up. And it's possible they were making it up, but as I said, the stories are told in a way that are so much like the stories they're getting from written sources that have been based on oral traditions, that almost certainly these are also based on oral traditions. Um, and so whether they come to them in written form or oral form, it's hard to tell, but uh, they, they definitely are earlier sources. And that, I think that's, there. I don't know, I. I, I don't think I know any scholars who believe that Matthew and Luke are just making those ones up. The, the scholars may exist, but I, I, offhand I can't think of any. Am I correct that you have, in the last couple of years, you have recently doubted the, the tomb narrative? Yeah, yeah. So um, I have. Um, so the gospel in the gospels, what happens is um, that Jesus, Jesus is crucified on a Friday, um, and it's he dies in the mid to late afternoon, and the sun's going down, and they can't leave him. And according, according to the gospel narratives, what happens is there's a Jewish leader who goes up to Pontius Pilate. The, the Jewish leader is Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph of Arimathea goes up to Pontius Pilate and says, look, you know, can I have the body? We need to bury him. And Pilate says, yes. Pilate gives him permission. And they take him off the cross. They bury him in a tomb. And then uh, on the third day, on Sunday morning, uh, the women go to the tomb and they find it empty. And they learn that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And so the empty tomb is usually touted as something that basically, you know, all the Gospels say it, and that basically this is something scholars agree on, that the tomb was empty on the third day. And non-believers would say, well, you know, something happened. You know, they, they went to the wrong tomb or they, uh, you know, the, 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 somebody stole the body or the disciples hid the body. And people come up with explanations why there's an empty tomb. But what people often say is, well, look, at least everybody agrees there was an empty tomb. 
So in the 19, a long time ago, a long time ago, John Dominic Crossan wrote a book uh, about the historical Jesus. He's a very prominent Jesus scholar who has um, uh, um, ideas that are very intelligent and challenging and controversial. And one of his ideas was that Jesus really wasn't, the, the tomb was not empty, that Jesus wasn't buried. And when I first read that, when it first came, I forget when it came out in the early 90s, I guess, I just rolled my eyes and said, oh my God, you gotta be kidding me, really? Come on. <laughs> so I thought that for years until I decided actually to look into it. I looked up every reference I could find in every Greek and Roman, every Greek and Latin source that talks about Roman practices of crucifixion. And it turns out the Romans had a standard practice, which was when somebody got crucified, they left them on the cross to, uh, in order to decay and to rot on the cross and to be subject to the scavengers. This was part of the punishment. Everyone today wants a decent burial. Nobody wants their corpse abused. But in the ancient world, this was a really big thing. I mean, it was like a ma really, really big thing. You want a decent burial. I mean, it's all over. Just read the Homer, read Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. A decent burial is like really important. Well, it's really important for Jews too. And Romans said, well, to hell with your views. We're going to leave you on a cross so that you are, you, everybody can see what's going to happen to them if they go against us. This was standard Roman policy. And Romans did not give a damn if Jews objected to this. Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate was not somebody who'd say, oh, you want the body? Sure, take the body. <laughs> no, it's just like it didn't happen. And so, uh, and so I don't, I, I came, so this is about five or six years ago when I realized this, because I read, I read all the sources. And uh, I don't think, that, I don't think it's, it's we, don't, we don't have any record of somebody named Joseph of Arimathea um, outside of these gospel accounts, and it's completely implausible. Uh, the disciples, by the way, in Matthew's gospel, and hinted at it, Mark, they get out of Jerusalem once Jesus is arrested. They get out of there, because if Jesus is going to be killed for what he was saying, they believe it. <laughs> so they, they got to get out. So they, they go back to Galilee. So they're not around. They don't see what happens to the body, uh, the followers of Jesus. I don't think Jesus had a decent burial. I think he was left on the cross. And that the disciples up in Galilee, they came to believe that he got raised from the dead. Um, I, I think some of them had some kind of visionary experience. Peter certainly had. Mary Magdalene probably appears to have had a visionary. They, something happened. They, they thought they saw Jesus, and they thought he got raised. They thought he got raised, they had to get buried, and so they came up with the burial narrative. So I, don't think, I personally don't think there was an empty tomb. So what do you think, uh, with that being in mind, what do you think about the swoon hypothesis, the theory that Jesus somehow survived the crucifixion? Yeah. Um, so there is a really fascinating book written about this. If you want to read a real, <laughs> a real interesting story about this, the um, Hugh Schoenfield in the 70s mm -hmm. wrote a book called The Passover Plot. He was a serious scholar. Um, he was a serious scholar who was an expert in ancient Judaism. Um, but uh, yeah. This swoon theory, uh, the idea is that Jesus, uh, he, he, Schoenfeld didn't invent this, by the way. It had been around for a very long time. It first um, kind of appeared in modern discourse um, in, uh, I, think it, I think this is the first time it appeared, in 1828, with, under, with the writing of Heinrich Paulus, who was a German theologian, who wrote a book called Das Leben Jesu, The Life of Jesus, where he argued that all of the things that thought were thought to be miracles by Jesus could be explained on natural grounds, that, that like, things happened and the disciples just misunderstood because they believed in miracles and they took something that wasn't miraculous and said it was a miracle, including Jesus fainting on the cross because, you know, he, he was beaten within an inch of his life by being flogged and then he's hanging on the cross and his vital signs slow down. He goes into a coma and they think he's dead, but then he gets revived in the cool of the tomb and he wakes up and he rolls the stone away and appears to his disciples and they think, oh, my God, he's been raised from the dead. And so, you know, then he goes off and crawls in a corner and dies someplace. So that was that was Pallas's theory. And then it was renewed by Schoenfeld and others. You know, yeah, of course, it's possible. I mean, you know, a hundred things are possible. A hundred things are possible. 
Um, this wound theory presupposes that Jesus was buried, um, which I don't think. It presupposes that Romans wouldn't recognize a dead man when they see him. <laughs> which, you know, I guess that's part of the theory. He's, he's, his vital signs have slowed down. Um, I, I really don't think... Um, we don't have we don't know of anybody that that happened to. People will say we do. Josephus talks about two people who were being crucified, who whom he knew, when he was in good good standing with the Roman authorities, and he asked that these people be taken down from their crosses, and they were, and one of them survived. Um, but they, this, neither of them swooned. Neither of them were taken for dead. These are people who were, be before they died, they were taken off. We don't have any evidence of anybody surviving crucifixion and then trying to get out of his grave. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I'm sure it could happen, but so could have a hundred other, other things. So what's your evidence? So as a historian, this is my thing. And, you know, you, this is a history, history broad podcast. So, I mean, it's, it's like, you, it's, it's what is the evidence? Historians go on the basis of evidence. If you want to see evidence for what Romans did to crucified victims, then read the ancient sources and you'll see they left them on the crosses. So I have a few questions um, from donors. I'll start off with Sylvester. Sylvester, he, he was a mythicist. He recently became convinced that Jesus was a historical figure. And he's asked, what are your thoughts on mythicism? So I guess I'll, I'll rephrase that by saying mythicism in general. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Mythicism has been around since the French Revolution. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there were mythicists in the 1800, late 1800s in France. Um, so it, it appears periodically. Uh, my sense is that it appeals to people who uh, like sensationalist ideas and who hate Christianity. Um, I think it's that combination that appeals to people because they they really they think Christianity is a disaster and it does a lot of harm in the world and that it's a joke, and so they want to they, they want to nip it in the bud and they do that by saying, well, Jesus didn't even exist. My view of it is that that is that mythicists shoot themselves in the foot um, because um, I don't think it's responsible history. And I, I'm not a Christian myself. I was a Christian. I was a very conservative Christian for many years. I'm not a Christian now. I don't identify with, um, I, I don't believe Jesus was the son of God who died for the sins of the world and was raised from the dead. I, I don't think that at all. But I don't think that the way to deal with the problems of Christianity is to take a stand that most people are just going to laugh at. And, you know, mythicists don't like to hear that. They don't like to hear it. But I'm just telling you, it's true. <laughs> Mythicists have their little group, and they, they build each other up. They support each other. And, they, and so, and I have, you know, in principle, I have no problem with it. I, my life would be no different if Jesus didn't exist. I would still teach the same thing pretty much. I mean, I would teach that Jesus didn't exist. But, I mean, I would still teach the New Testament, and it wouldn't change my beliefs about anything. So it's not that I have a religious reason against it. I just think historically it is not solid it's i mean it's, it's 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 so shallow historically making up ideas about pagan gods that are just false and saying that jesus is just like all these pagan gods which just you're just making stuff up and you shouldn't do that why not just do history and you can still show that there are real problems with christian with historical christianity by doing history so that, that's what i would propose people do <laughs> do history i think in a way you answered his next question and that was, why is mythicism rejected by scholars? Look, the evidence, scholars, mm. mo most scholars of the New Testament, of course, are Christians. Because, you know, who else is going to study the New Testament <laughs> at this level? You, you, mostly you either start out a Christian, or not all of them. I've had, I know a lot of people who are just atheists, who are just fascinated with the New Testament, become scholars of it. But, um, the, the, the presupposition of the question is right. Scholars do not take this seriously. Uh, I mean, some do, I guess. They take it seriously enough to think, it, you know, to look into it. But um, the books that are most popular among mythicists, arguing mythicism, are read by virtually no scholar. I don't have any, I've got hundreds, I've got hundreds of friends in this field. 
I don't think I know anyone who's actually read most of these books because it's, the evidence for Jesus is so overwhelming to people who, who just are historians that, so yeah, so that's why, because the evidence. And because of the overwhelming evidence, mythicism isn't really considered a possibility. An impossible, no, it's not impossible. It's just like nothing, almost nothing in history is impossible. I mean, it's, it's possible that, that Lincoln got shot by a Martian who is imitating, is pretending to be John Wilkes Booth. I mean, it's possible, but what is the likelihood? You know, it's possible that World War II, that the Allies won World War II because God intervened and did a miracle. Yeah, okay. But I mean, it's not, how do you, how do you establish the plausibility of that? You know, so, mm -hmm. so history works on the basis of what is most probable and the only way to know is to look at historical evidence. And if you refuse to consider evidence or if you just write off evidence as irrelevant, then you're not being a historian. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you've got an agenda. There has, I've never, I've, I've met lots of mythicists. I have never met a mythicist without an agenda. An agenda precisely for their view. You know, and it, so it's like, um, you know, if you've got a if you've got a rabid liberal Democrat and you've got a rabid liberal Republican who discuss a historical event and it turns out the historical event turns out the way that their ideology requires it to turn out. Well, it's probably something to do with their ideology. You should look at the evidence, though, without having an ideological bias about it. Another donor. Liran asks, what language did Jesus speak? Um, I think this is virtually certain. Again, a hist history is always a matter of probabilities, but it's virtually certain Jesus spoke Aramaic. Aramaic was the language of rural Galilee. We know this for a fact because we have all sorts of evidence, including, and we've got all sorts of, like a, but the big question among scholars is, so Aramaic is a language that's related to Hebrew, it came into uh, what became Palestine uh, because the Persians were in control of, of, of Israel, of Judah, uh, for a time. And the Persian language was, they spoke Aramaic at the time. Aramaic became the language, and it was a prominent language in Israel from, for a couple hundred years before Jesus. And so that was the language everybody spoke. So that was the local language. Some, some highly educated people in Israel at Jesus' time could speak Greek, but they were only the higher, highly educated people who had had some kind of education. Some other people might have had a smattering of Greek, uh, but I don't think it's likely that Jesus, who grew up in a tiny little hamlet, uh, Nazareth, I don't, he, would not have had, he would not have been to school because there wasn't, probably wasn't a school in uh, Nazareth, and certainly not a school that taught Greek. So um, it's debated among scholars. I don't think Jesus could speak Greek. It certainly couldn't speak uh, Latin, I think. So last question from another donor. Sean asks, what are the facts and sayings about Jesus that are likely to be true from the Gospels and epistles? Right. So it's a very, it's a really good question. And it would take a long time probably to go through everything. Um, if you're really interested in my view of this, I, I have a book called... Um, Jesus, Apocalyptic Prophet of the New Millennium, where I lay out the, the ways historians go about establishing what happened in the past, and specifically, how you can deal with our sources for Jesus to know what he probably said and did, given the fact that there's so much legendary material as well. And so how do you separate the legends from the, from the historical reality is what the book's about. And I have, a couple, I have several chapters then that lay out what I think you can say with reasonable probability Jesus said and did. Um, in, terms of, in terms of his message, uh, I, think, I think you can show that Jesus principally taught an apocalyptic message that God was soon going to uh, intervene in history. Uh, as other apocalyptists have said, the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls and Pharisees and John the Baptist, there were lots of people who had these ideas. Uh, Jesus had his own special kind of twist on it, but that, but that the kingdom of God was soon to arrive. People needed to prepare for it. They needed to turn away from their sinful lives and turn back to God by keeping the laws that God had given them. 
In particular, they needed to devote themselves to following what God required for their worship of him, and they needed to treat one another well. They needed to love their neighbor as much as they love themselves and not go around trying to screw their neighbor the whole time, <laughs> trying to burn and turn, you know, trying to. And so they need, they need to live lives of love. Um, Jesus taught a number of the parables we have about the coming kingdom. Um, and so uh, there, there are a number of things he taught that we can say with some relative probability. Um, I think it's, I think Jesus, you can say in terms of his life, you could say he was certainly a Jew who came from this little place called Nazareth. Uh, that he was raised Jewish, he followed Jewish customs, he understood himself as he grew up to be a Jewish teacher who left home and engaged in itinerant preaching ministry. He, um, at some point, he acquired a reputation for doing spectacular deeds. I don't know if that happened during his life, whether his reputation started during his life or not, but the Gospels say it did, so I don't know, maybe it did, maybe not. Um, but I think certainly what happened at the end of his life is that he and his followers that he had acquired, I think he probably did have 12 followers, uh, men, disciples, that they took a trip to Jerusalem uh, to celebrate a Passover feast. And while there, he, um, he got on the wrong side of the Jewish authorities, probably by uh, raising Cain in the Jewish temple and causing problems, and by preaching that God was soon going to destroy the temple as part of his message. And the Jewish leaders thought that this would be this was an incendiary message, and that it could lead to problems among the the many pilgrims there for Passover, and so to avoid mob violence, they had him um, had him taken out of the way, uh, handed him over to the Romans to deal with, and the Romans crucified him. Uh, and so uh, that that's kind of like a tiny little nutshell, is what I think you could say with relative certainty. So you, you so you would say that the apocalyptic sayings are more likely to have been said about uh, by the historical Jesus, like okay, the, the coming apocalypse, um, or something along the lines, maybe not quite as precise as Mark thirteen portrays it, because Mark is clearly written after its destruction of the temple. Yeah. So, but so he predicted something, maybe not quite like the temple being destroyed, but probably something close to that. I think that the, the thing is that when you look, when, that when we were earlier talking about the different sources, one of the mm -hmm. values of recognizing you've got different sources is that if there was an M and there was a Q and there was a Mark and there, there was definitely was a Mark and there these other sources, you can count and you've got these John sources and things, you can, you can look at all of them and if they, if they aren't relying on each other and they have similar material in them, you know, the similar material has to predate all of the sources. And the more sources you've got saying it, the more likely it's an early date. And so, like, in all these sources, Mark, Q, M, and L, uh, you have sayings of Jesus predicting that the end is going to come soon uh, and that the kingdom of God is soon to arrive and that the son of that's this cosmic figure he calls the son of man is going to come as a judge of the earth to wipe out the powers of evil. And you also have multiply attested in these independent sources, Jesus predicting that when God destroys the forces of evil, uh, it's going to include the destruction of the temple. Um, there's nothing weird about this. In other words, you don't have to be the son of God to realize what's going to happen pretty soon, uh, because we have other people predicting that the temple is going to be destroyed, um, and people do predict that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. I mean, there are people today who are predicting that, you know, <laughs> the United States is going to be destroyed. <laughs> One of these days, those people are going to be right. <laughs> they might be in a thousand years, but I mean, people are going to. So, like, you know, you have people predict things and sometimes they end up being right. Uh, and in that period, it probably wasn't that hard to imagine an uprising of Jews that would lead to. I mean, would, it happened before <laughs> when Jews up, came up against a foreign power and the temple got destroyed. So it's not that weird to think somebody could imagine it's going to happen again, especially because Josephus tells us other people were saying similar things at the time. And so uh, it doesn't make him, doesn't make it miraculous. It just like, so I think, yes, I think he did predict this. And, um, and I think that's what got him into trouble with the authorities um, who wanted nothing to do with this because the authorities who had Jesus arrested were precisely the ones who were in charge of the temple. And so Jesus is basically saying that God is your enemy. <laughs> God, the Jewish God is your enemy. I think, what the hell? And so they, they get him, you know, they, they take care of him. 
So why do you think that the Gospel of Matthew, the second Gospel, relocates the birth location of Jesus to Bethlehem, whereas Mark says it was at Nazareth in Galilee? Mark actually doesn't say it's Nazareth, but he presupposes it's Nazareth. Mm. Uh, both Matthew and Luke, um, it, Mark doesn't actually say anything, anything about Jesus' birth. He only talked about Jesus. He says he came from Nazareth, mm -hmm. but he could he comes from Nazareth. Yeah, that's from Matthew and Luke that's too. what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. In Matthew and Luke, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, even though he comes from Nazareth. Um, and so um, it's interesting because when you do a careful comparison of Matthew and uh, Luke, um, they both have Jesus born in Bethlehem, even though he's raised in Nazareth, but they get it done in different ways that in fact are contradictory. If you compare how Matthew gets Jesus born in Bethlehem with how Luke gets Jesus born in Bethlehem, like they, they, they can't be reconciled. Um, what it shows is they were really eager for him to be born in Bethlehem <laughs> because they went out of their way to do it, even though they both knew he came from Nazareth. And so the question is why, and Matthew actually tells you why. Is because Matthew indicates that Jesus was born in Bethlehem to fulfill what was spoken of in the prophet. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the Old Testament prophet Micah, Micah indicates that a Savior will come from Bethlehem. Bethlehem uh, was the place was because Bethlehem was the birthplace of King David. And so the future son of David, the future Messiah, will also come from Bethlehem. And so Matthew has a quandary, and so does Luke. They know that Jesus came from Nazareth, but he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. <laughs> and so they arrange for him to be born in Bethlehem, but they get there in different ways that, that are actually contradictory. I want to go back to the to the James passage, the, the James and Jesus passages we were talking about earlier in Josephus. There are a lot of mythicists that believe that in the James passage, because they because some of them will go the extra mile and say, oh, not only is the testimonium a total interpolation, but some of them will go as far as saying that James, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, the who was called Christ in the James passage, is also itself an interpolation, and that the James there is the brother of this high priest, Jesus, son of Damnius, and that this Jesus was appointed to, uh, to the position of high priest because his brother James was killed by Ananus, the previous high priest. Yeah, uh, no, there are a lot of theories about this. And I would say that just on the most simple terms, uh, the best evidence that this is not an interpolation, but it's something Je Je Josephus actually wrote, is because if a Christian interpolated that, they would not have, had, they would not have said, Jesus, who is called the Christ. They would have said, Jesus, who is the Christ? So that, that suggests that it's somebody who does not believe Jesus is the Messiah who, who wrote it, and that would be Josephus. It's just like um, this, this, this phrasing is common in ancient texts. I mean, for, just to give you a, a kind of a parallel example, uh, the, the author Irenaeus, who was a church father, was writing against the Gnostics that he considered to be heretics. Gnostics are called Gnostics because it comes from the Greek word knowledge, gnosis. And Gnostics called themselves Gnostics because they said, we know. <laughs> we know the truth, and the truth is what saves us. And you, other Christians, don't know, and so you're not, you know, you're not going to be saved. Um, Irenaeus wrote five volumes that's usually called Against the Heresies. But what he, what, um, the way he titles it is Against Gnosis, as it's called, which means, yeah, it's not really Gnosis. <laughs> it's not really knowledge. It's just called that. And that's the same thing Josephus is doing earlier. Jesus, who's called the Christ, meaning he's not really, but people are calling him mm -hmm. that. So I don't think a Christian would have written that. So I don't think it's an interpolation. I think it's something Josephus wrote. And the late second century, early first century CE church father Origen was irritated by that. And he, said, uh, and he talked about Josephus not believing Jesus was the Christ. And that is, is, is only more evidence that, that, okay, you have early church uh, writers like Origen that are aware that Josephus actually did write that. 
But then the, the Mephistos will go even further and say, well, Origen was confused, and he was quoting Hegesippus, Hegesippus who said that the death of James caused the destruction of the temple. How would you respond yeah. to that? Yeah, well, look, just read the sources yourself. I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, people, look, it's, it's very easy to take these sources and just to come up with a theory to explain what you already want to believe. Just read the sources. Read Hegesippus. I mean, you get a Eusebius, and and you get you know, and you, you can get Origin. I mean, Origin you know is available, <laughs> widely available. Uh, they have to discount it as evidence because it goes against their view. So if you discount all the evidence for the other side, then the other side doesn't have any evidence. Okay. Well, <laughs> but again, I mean, how much evidence do you need? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> How much evidence do you need? <laughs> well, we're almost done here. I think this might be my last question. And my last question is, again, on the Mephesis, they, they also go as far as saying, and, and you talked about this earlier, that Paul is explicit that Jesus was crucified. And he goes as far as in one Thessalonians even claiming the Jews did it at one point or the one plus always two thirteen to sixteen. Um I I guess it might be two questions because I am curious about that. Uh there are some that claim that one Thessalonians two thirteen to sixteen is a total interpolation, partial interpolation. What do you think about yeah. that? So this is a uh, it's a complicated passage. Um it's the passage where Paul um Paul is talking to the Thessalonians, who, of course, live in Thessalonica, which is, being, if you were visiting Greece today, if you're on a tour, Thessalonica is one of the places people go in Greece. It's a, it was a, one of uh, Paul's churches where he, he went to Thessalonica and he started a church there and then he left. And um, he's writing he's writing back, First Thessalonians, he's writing back to the Thessalonians and he's trying to comfort them because they're suffering persecution and they've got some questions. And so he's, you know, and the persecution in this context does not mean that like the Roman emperors kept break, you know, cracking the whip on them. It, in this case, it means that they're like, their friends and neighbors are giving them a hard time hmm. and, you know, maybe throwing rocks at their walls or something, I don't know. But it's so, but it's not like a Roman persecution. Paul's writing them and he says, look, you know, you're, you, you're being stalwart in your faith. You're being strong in your faith. Keep it up because word about your, your faith in the, in the face of hardship has gone around and it's spread throughout Achaia and Macedonia and people have heard about it, stay true to the faith. And it says, you know, you're being persecuted by your country people, your compatriots, just as, um, as uh, the Jews are, in, the, the, the Christians are in Judea, followers of Jesus are in Judea, by the Judeans who, and then he gives this list of things who, um, you know, who killed the Lord Jesus and refused to let us speak to the Gentiles so that they might be saved. And he goes through this list of things. And then he says, and because of that, the wrath of God has come upon them. So that's the part that people have trouble with because people normally interpret this to me, not normally. Many people read this, well, the Judeans have the wrath of God come upon them. That sounds like the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. But Paul was writing this letter almost certainly in the year 49 or 50. So how would he know about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem? That must be an interpolation. That's, that's, the, that's the line. And so it's either the whole passage is an interpolation is the statement, or just as bit about the wrath of God has come upon them is the interpolation. By interpolation, I mean that somebody, uh, somebody other than the author inserted the passage and then all of our manuscripts have the passage. Okay, that's an important point I'm making, and people, people tend not to get it. And still, it might not be clear, but it's different from a scribe changing a passage where you have different manuscripts that have the two forms of the text, the original text and the change text. That's a textual change. If somebody changed the text and all the manuscripts have it, that's not textual. That's not called a textual corruption or textual. That's called an interpolation. It's just a difference. So, this the idea is this is an interpolation because every manuscript of First Thessalonians has this passage, and so it's not a scribal change that's found in some manuscript. It's like it'd be an interpolation. 
I have never been persuaded by this. Hmm. Um, I'm, I have no reason not to be persuaded other than I don't think there's good evidence for it. Um, if somebody did interpolate this passage, it had to be interpolated before all of the copy, uh, before the copy, how do, how do I put this in language that is not technical? Um, if Before you have a copy, copy of First Thessalonians, well, no, I, I want to use the term exemplar, but I don't think people mm -hmm. know the term exemplar. So, so every copy you've got, suppose you've got a copy of First Thessalonians from the year 600. That was copied from a copy that was copied from a copy that was copied from a copy that was copied from a copy. Okay? And all the manuscripts ultimately can do that. You can do the copy, 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 and they have different lineages, right? They have different genealogies, but they all go back to something. If there's a passage in every manuscript, they all go back to a copy that had that passage in it. That's called the exemplar. Okay? It's the, ex it's the exemplar that gives you all the surviving copies. It doesn't have to be the original, but it has to be the exemplar. All of our lines of transmission for Thessalonians go back to that exemplar. They all go back to that exemplar. Which suggest, I mean, since these lines of transmission, this copy, this, I'm sorry, I, have, I don't know how not to be technical, but, but like this cop, whoever, when Paul sent first Thessalonians to Thessalonica, they had the copy, then somebody made the copy. Then somebody else copied it. And this copy went here to be copied, and that copy went there to be copied, and that copy was copied. And then, so ultimately, they all go back to the original in some sense. It's hard to imagine in an interpolation, they got into all the copies. So it did happen on occasion, but when it happens in Paul's letters, it happens a couple of times in Paul's letter, I think almost certainly there's an interpolation, but there's really good evidence. And in this case, the passage actually fits really well with the context. And the claim that the wrath of God has come upon them must refer to Jerusalem, I think, is wrong. Paul talks elsewhere about the wrath of God coming on people. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Paul talks about the wrath of God coming upon pagans for worshiping pagan, for worshiping idols. It doesn't refer to a specific event like the destruction of Rome or something. It refers to God punishing them. Paul thinks of God as punishing Jews, Judeans, for what they did to Jesus. So um, it doesn't mean it doesn't have to mean the destruction of Jerusalem. If you think it is a destruction of Jerusalem, then yeah, it's an interpolation. Otherwise, you know, I don't think it has to mean that because of the way Paul uses the term elsewhere. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> That's fine. Final question. Mythicists often look at the Pauline epistles and they'll say, oh, Jesus was crucified by the rulers of the age, First and Second Corinthians, or, or in Second Corinthians it talks about, okay, Satan's involved now. And they'll say, well, that's evidence that Jesus was crucified by heavenly powers, not human beings. Could you explain why that doesn't work? <laughs> they don't only really say that. They say that he was crucified in heaven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? 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 Where, is, where did you get that from? <laughs> I can make it up. There's no, there's no story about Jesus being crucified in heaven. Come on. But yes, Paul, Paul believed that the power, Paul was an apocalypticist. Paul believed that the powers of evil were affecting people here on earth and that they were forcing people to do bad things. There's a the power of sin. Everybody has the power of sin that is controlling them, that is making them do bad things. When Paul talks about the rulers, sometimes he actually means the rulers. He means like, you know, the Roman authorities, and he means like the Jewish leaders. So he sometimes he means the authorities. But if these rulers are acting in evil ways, it's because Satan is among them making them do it and the, and the other evil forces. Paul talks about this kind of thing all the time. He talks about in Corinthians. He talks about Satan deceiving people because he comes as an angel of light. It doesn't mean these people are being deceived in heaven. They're deceived here on earth because this is where Satan is. Paul does not think that Satan is in heaven. Early Jewish apocalypticists thought that Satan had been cast out of heaven with the demons and they were here on earth. They are not active in heaven, precisely not active in heaven. God has kicked them out. God won't let them in heaven. They're not crucifying people up in heaven. And so I didn't, you know, 
Look, look, I get it. I mean, it can be. I can see why people read it that way. It doesn't make sense if you understand if you know the sources. You actually read what Paul said. If you study all of Paul, and you'll see what it means. And so, it absolutely does not mean that Jesus got crucified in heaven by you know the devil's henchmen or something. It just doesn't mean that. I again, let me emphasize. I. I'm trying to approach this as a historian. I get, ex- I do get exasperated with the mythicists because mythicists and I agree on a lot of things uh, about, well, with a lot of things actually about religion and about the damage that it can do, and uh, about uh, about theology. We agree on a lot of things, but arguing that Jesus himself is a myth is just shooting yourself in the foot it, because it's just not credible historically. And so there, there are better strategies, in my opinion. Every time I say this, people get all upset with me, and I, I get it. And they, they think I'm being an elitist, and I just, I'm, I'm just, you know, I think that there are better ways to do to if, if I think there are better ways to do it, and I don't think it's responsible history myself. Well, okay, so so, so Rob, Jacob, I know it's time to end, but can I make can I say two other things about sure. uh, unrelated to your questions sure. <laughs> before we? Before we enter. One is somebody was asking me about the Nazareth thing, about being born in Bethlehem and Matthew and things. So I, I've just started announcing, I, I have, I've, I've not started publicizing this, but there is going to be an event that I would like people to know about. It's going to be on December 5th. Um, and uh, mythicists will like this. <laughs> uh, non-mythicists will, uh, will appreciate this. Christians will appreciate it. Uh, it's, the, it's going to be an all-day event a four lecture uh, seminar that is going to be on um, what re- did, it's going to be called did the Christmas story really happen? Uh, and so it's going to be all about what we know about the stories about Jesus birth, what we really know about them. Um, and looking at the gospels, looking at legends, looking at legends in the gospels, trying to figure out, can we say anything about the birth of Jesus? You know, like, was there snow on the ground? <laughs> uh, and so, like, okay, I'm, I'm being facetious. But, but it will be four, four lectures. Uh, there will um, for, there'll be, there's tickets involved. It will be uh, a pay-for event. Um, normally, when I do these events, I do them for, like, the Smithsonian Institute or whatever. And normally, the charge is, like, $90 for the day. Uh, this... We're going to be advertising this. This event will be um, $49.95 for the entire day. Four four full lectures of question and answer after each one of them uh, on December 5th, Sunday, December 5th. Um, And if people register early, there's a $10 discount, $39.95. I mean, that's pretty pretty good. So um, if they're interested in that, all they need to do is go to bartderman.com slash Christmas. BartDerman.com slash Chris, and they can see see this. The other thing I'd like people to know that if they don't know about, you really ought to know about my blog. I talk about I talk about this kind of stuff that, that Jacob and I have been talking about. I talk about this kind of stuff all the time. Five, I post five times a week, 12 to 1400 words a day, five times a week, going back tonight to 2012, and you have access to all the archives. It's a small fee. All the fee goes to charity to help the poor. Help the hungry and the homeless. The Bart Ehrman blog. Just look it up. You can see it. All right. I'll be sure to uh, to include the links in the description of this video. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining me, Bart Ehrman. Okay. Thank you for having me, Jacob. I appreciate I appreciate everybody's questions, and uh, and I, ho- I hope it's been helpful. I think it has been very helpful. Thank you. Well. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.